Good evening, everyone. I'm Keith Brown, a teacher at Bret Hart Middle School, released as president of the Oakland Education Association. Welcome to Facebook Live OEA Bargaining Update. Our 21 member bargaining team, educators across the Oakland Unified School District, proud members of the Oakland Education Association are here and our bargaining team, classroom teachers and educators spending their so many countless hours over the summer to negotiate uh, a memorandum of understanding to make sure that our students get um, the best education possible, the best crisis learning experience possible. So I want to introduce our bargaining chair, Patty Segura, and also our co-chair and second vice president, Chaz Garcia. Hi everyone, my name is Patricia Segura. I'm an Oakland Unified School District alumni. I am a teacher at Fremont High School and also a parent of an OUSD student. Uh, I am chairing this MOU negotiations. Um, and I wanna share a little bit of what my experience has been. Um, I have participated in the past two bargaining sessions, um, but this has been definitely a, a learning experience being under the circumstances of this pandemic um, and has definitely increased the hardships on our families. As a parent of two and as a daughter of two disabled parents, I am dedicated to this, um, to these negotiations because we are fighting life and death and we're here to um, do that. It has not been easy um, trying to limit our bubble in terms of childcare and having to bargain with my toddler on my arms and um, my five-year-old attached to a screen because I can't take care of her has been definitely um, a hardship, but also I also continue grounding myself that this is, um, we're doing this to um, for, for our community, you know, our, our parents, our students to serve better than what is being proposed at the table. And we're giving long hours, long weeks, long days um, to ensure that we are going back safely and that we have the appropriate um, resources to make this a successful year. Chas. Good evening, everyone. I'm Chaz Garcia. I am the co-chair and second vice president of OEA. Um, I have been teaching here in Oakland for 26 years and I'm very proud to be a part of this team and working very closely with everyone, especially Patty, who I've learned so much from. Um, we are going to be discussing the state of bargaining and also giving an inside picture as to what bargaining is really like for our team. And again, we're 21 members strong. So we wanna begin by hearing some stories from our members um, around what it's like at the bargaining table. And we're going to begin with Robbie. Good evening, everyone. I'm Robbie Kendall, I'm a school psychologist. Um, as you can probably tell, um, bargaining is quite emotional um, lately. We are all under a lot of stress in our own personal and professional lives. And we are under a lot of pressure to um, really put forth a, um, an MOU that will best service our students, our communities, our staff, um, staff who are um, struggling with their own um, issues as well by working from home through distance learning. So we are um, really uh, doing our best to um, manage the outside pressure, our, our inner pressure. And while we are working collabor collaboratively with uh, one another, I am working with um, amazing um, staff uh, across all of OUSD, um, our members. And um, I'm really happy to be part of, part of the team. And I'm looking forward to um, getting an MOU through that will best service um, our students. Robbie. Uh, Maranatha is also going to share what her experience has been like at the bargaining table. Thanks, Chaz. And thank you to all of you. Um, working with you has been 
like I'm going to be an emotional too. This has been an emotional month and we were up until 3.30 last night. I still have to wake up and be a mom and do all my duties in the morning. So yes, it is very emotional. That said, um, we are standing strong and advocating for our families and for our students, for our community. Um, I would never choose otherwise. I'm glad that I decided to do this. Um, and I wanted to give a shout out to the team because no matter what, everybody is so positive and encouraging and says kind words to each other and you're creative and you know, thank you for that language. Um, and we just keep getting back up no matter how many times we get pushed down and denied. And um, it's just been very uplifting. So thank you. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Maranatha. And on that note, I think it's really important to highlight some of the times when we have really felt very powerful. And Kahinde is here to share some of those experiences with you all. Hi, everyone. My name is Kahinde Salter. I am in my 21st year of teaching. I teach at Fremont High School, five years with inside of OUSD. And um, a couple of people, um, on the bargaining team, a lot of people actually helped to co-create this language for the Black Sanctuary, focusing on OUSD explicitly including its Black students in its sanctuary model, um, as proposed in 2016. Um, the district has implemented these policies and procedures that have seen a lot of Black people leaving the district for multiple reasons. And we are saying that that needs to stop. We need to retain the Black students that are still in our district. We need to make sure that we have Black teachers teaching those Black students and other students as well. And so this was a part of our, this was our proposal that we drafted to make sure that OUSD focuses on all of our students and rights the wrongs that have been done to Black students specifically. So it did feel very powerful presenting this when we presented it to the district. And we hope that you guys will see the efforts of that or see the results of that effort coming up towards you all really, really soon. Thank you. Thank you, Kahinde. And despite some definite highs, we've also had some frustrating moments and um, a couple of my bargaining team members here are going to share um, some of those experiences with you because it is not all uh, rainbows and unicorns around here. Uh, Vlad, would you like to kick us off? Oh my God, yes. Uh, I'm Vlad, I am, kids know me as Dr. Vlad. I teach at West Oakland Middle School. I live in West Oakland, uh, five blocks from my school. So I'm part of my community. I lo love my community and I approached my time at, at the bargaining table uh, as a chance to advocate for my community and my kids. Um, I don't think anything in this month of July has been as frustrating as the topic of mini -mesters. Um, I have gotten upset and have gone over it so many times, have walked away from the table and came back to the table trying to inform the best decision for our students. So um, it was frustrating to raise that topic and be continuously ignored by the district on many occasions and then to be heard and then not do anything about it. Um, I would just like to use, you know, talking to some other sites and, and other clusters, I've discovered that our community is not informed about all of the aspects of mini -mesters. And if you would like to bear with me for two minutes, I would just like to quickly walk you through my teacher illustrations that I would use in my regular class and show you what the mini masters are and why I've been fighting them the entire month. So last time our students had structured instruction was March 13th. August 13th will be exactly five months since March. If we count for one month for technology distribution, we're talking about six months of no learning. The first mini master will take two months of learning followed by two months of a break for those courses, then another mini master, and then five more months of no learning for that course. Best case scenario, in the next 17 months between March 2020, which was this year, 
and August 2021, which will be the beginning of the following school year. Best case scenario means that four months out of 17 months, students will have structured learning in a course and 13 months without structured learning. That is thinking that we will have both mini masters maximized with the instructional time, technology, and everything else. Worst case scenario, the first mini master takes a big hit with the technology distribution, people's learning curve, and trying to uh, get operational with all of the platforms, in which case we're talking about two months of structured learning for a course and 15 months without. So I want to ask everybody listening, if I told you that the next 17 months, your own child would, do, would have two months of math at any given age, would you sign up for it? Thinking about our community and what crisis distance learning is going to do to everybody, we're talking about a learning loss that's similar to that one that happens during the summer months. So we all know as teachers that there is a loss of learning that happens between the end of the school year and the beginning of the next school year. According to the study done by Brown University and University of Virginia, average third graders lose 20% of their reading skills and 27% of their math skills after third grade. And seventh graders lose 36% of their reading skill and 50% of their math skill. All of this is speculation about how much learning we're going to lose in a program that is talking about 15 months of no structured learning for a course content. Finally, to put everything in perspective, Harvard and Brown study with a sample size of 800,000 uh, students, just in the month between March and April of this school year, saw that student progress in math in low income zip codes dropped by 50%, middle income zip codes by 33%, and high income zip, zip codes by 0%. Disparities were not due to the lack of parental support, meaning that the poor parents versus parents in, in, uh, in households with income over $200,000 did not uh, work with their students any less. On average, they all work 13 hours per week. With optimal quality across all zip codes, average student at the end of Corona is going to, at the end of the year, between March of 2020 and August 2021, with optimal education online, is going to be seven months behind academically. For our Black students, that will be 10 months behind academically, and our Latinx students, they will be nine months behind academically. What means is that in the world after Corona, the effect of learning loss for a white student will be 1.6% of their annual income. For a black student, that will be 3.3% of their annual income. And for a Latinx students, that will be 3% of their annual income. So it's not necessarily that mini master is a bad idea in general. It may not be the best idea for all of our schools, given our limited resources, staffing, student population and resources. Thank you. Thank you, Vlad. Um, next, we'll hear from Heather, who's one of our um, SLPs here in the district on our team. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much, Vlad. Um, your passion really shines through and really highlights some of the frustrations I've also shared with the district and speaks to what's like kind of behind those frustrations is this real sense of empowerment. Like we are still at the table despite our frustrations. And that is amazing that we can stay at the table and advocate for our students. Um, as Chaz mentioned, I'm a speech therapist and related service providers often are overlooked or not brought to the table or not even considered when the district is making their decisions. Um, and our students definitely suffer for that. So, when we're sitting at the at the table with the district and they overlook our language that we articulate for our students and trying to make sure that we can have reduced caseloads so that they can actually get the services that they deserve. Um, 
it's really upsetting and it's really frustrating. But then on that other side is that beautiful empowerment that we get from all being there together. And this speech therapist actually being at the table is has been really beautiful and wonderful. And I feel so honored that I'm part of this team um, and that I can advocate for my students here. Yeah. Thank you, Heather. And you've been an incredible resource to all of us at the table too. Robbie is going to, don't worry, this isn't going to be a um, kind of frustration festival, uh, but we do want you to get some real insight into what it's been like. So Robbie's going to uh, conclude the frustration segment. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna turn it around after this. Uh, yeah, as you can probably imagine, there's a lot of frustration, um, you know, and it does hit us at different times. Um, and sometimes it's very unpredictable and sometimes it's very intense and we have to step away. Um, but what we do do um, for that is we do check in with each other, rely on each other. Um, and we just, we just turn it around and, and uh, to be positive and get through what we need to get through. Uh, one thing that I, I think is mutually shared across um, the other bargaining team members is, you know, we, we were uh, at the table until 3.30 in the morning. We have put many, many hours into our the MOU and um, when we do go to the table and we see very little change in the district side when they um, present their counter and we have made movement or we have listened to them and we've AB 77, all sorts of things that we've had to uh, integrate into our uh, proposals. Um, it's very frustrating to come to a table after a seven hour delay, which happened about yesterday from them, um, and to see no movement. Um, so that is extremely frustrating for many of us. Thank you, Robbie. So with that, um, we really would like to give you an idea of what an acceptable agreement would look like. Um, and a few of our bargaining team members are going to discuss that, beginning with Catherine from my, my old school Esperanza. I'm at Esperanza, I'm a third grade teacher there. And one of the things that would be acceptable to us is that our students all have technology that includes Chromebooks that have the system requirements to use the features that we all know our students need to be able to use on Zoom to be able to um, have multiple screens open and be able to toggle back and forth between that for reading and small groups. And of course, everybody needs internet to, to be able to um, provide that. We know that the district is working on it and it's definitely one of our requirements that hotspots be available and made available now so that we can begin instruction as we're expected to. And also the same requirements for teachers, the demands on our computers are great. And we expect that we're able to be able to, um, to present and have our face showing and also be able to be heard. And we know that this is, um, has been a challenge for many teachers. And so we're ex we are um, waiting to see this come to fruition. And thank you um, to everybody who's presented before and thank you to our team. It is a very empowering um, situation to be sitting here with all 20 of one of us. It's, it's been an amazing time. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Natasha is going to talk about something else that is also very close and very important to every member I know and community member out there. Yes, thank you, Chaz, and thank you, Catherine, for those words, and it is very empowering. I'm Natasha Williams, and I'm one of the school nurses, one of the 26 school nurses, and I'm at Edna Brewer, Horace Mann, and Bella Vista. And so we've heard from members, we've heard from the community, we need to put safety first. And our proposal does that, it puts safety first. So the district has agreed to our criteria two, but they have not agreed with our criteria one. And our latest um, proposal on the criteria, we did even define further our criteria one to make it very clear. We know that the situation on COVID is constantly changing. We're hearing many different facts and numbers, um, but we are putting the scientific data first. That is our criteria one, and we are gonna uphold that. Like I said, we've heard from everybody. We've heard the, from the community and we've heard from our unit members and we need to continue to put that first. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Natasha. Another kind of pillar of um, acceptable agreements is something that's woven throughout everything that we do in education, and that is, you know, building relationships and having that social emotional piece there. And Tim's going to talk a little bit about how that plays into an acceptable MOU. Thanks, Chaz. Hey, everyone. Tim Douglas at International Community School. Um, yeah, the more we see what's happening at the state and at you know throughout the country, we realize we are in it, still in a crisis. Um, this is why we led with our OEA strong plan um, of those full two weeks of uh, synchronous instruction, 60 minutes with uh, the rest of the time for prep and planning time. Um, we really hope that as in the spring, teachers took on the responsibility of wellness checks and distributing technology and food cards and uh, materials to students. We know that teachers are gonna do that in the fall. So what we're doing with this OEA Strong Start Plan is to give teachers that amount of time to build those relationships, um, to invest that time, to get to know students, uh, to know what kind of situations they have at home, whether they have tech. Um, we know that tech's not gonna be ready in the beginning of the year. So this is our plan to really blood on the process, make sure families are safe, make sure they have access, make sure we develop relationships because we're still very much in a crisis and um, we're holding holding true to our safety and, and time to, to build relationships. Thanks, Tim. And, and recognizing that um, our first go around at distance learning was traumatic for everyone involved and did not um, reach the expectations which we all had hoped. Um, we are all committed to doing much better. And he's going to talk about exactly how that would play out in the MOU. Hey everyone, I'm Heath Badam. I teach at Oakland Tech and I'm also the parent of two kids at uh, Lincoln Elementary. And so, yeah, you know, we all know that we need time to plan high quality instruction under normal conditions. Uh, and we're not working under normal conditions right now. We're in this crisis distance learning. You know, we all know that the spring uh, things were, you know, difficult because we didn't have time to plan. We were thrown into that experience. We were told to just pack up our classrooms and that schools would be closed and we didn't have real time to plan and, and think about what uh, it should look like. Um, and so we just think it's really critical that there is enough time for teachers to be thoughtful and intentional and not just plan on their own, but plan in their professional learning communities and grade level teams in content area teams so that the instruction and the learning experience for students is high quality to the extent it can be under these conditions and just better than the spring. And just, you know, I would just add that, you know, there's like these comments going around, or at least I've heard a little bit, well, teachers should have been planning over the summer, but it's like, we need the time now as the year is getting underway, because over the summer, it wasn't clear what we were going to be stepping into. You know, the, the narrative kept changing, we might be going back in person, maybe the virus is receding. And then there was never a real clear picture, I think, for most teachers about what we should be preparing for. And so that's why it's really critical in our view that we have sufficient planning time, particularly front loaded at the beginning of the year so that people can do the work in their teams and just even on their own to get uh, their plans ready. I mean, I, I can't think of many other jobs that have shifted as dramatically as teaching given the pandemic. You know, there are people I know who are, if, you know, you have an office job and you're working from home, the nature of your work hasn't changed that much. You're maybe still working at a computer and having meetings uh, you know, with your colleagues on the screen, but for teaching, it's dramatically different to teach through the screen than to be in the classroom. And I just think it's like so different and we really need the time so that we can get it right and do, uh, do right by our students. Thank you, Heath. So with that, we're, you know, wanting to make sure that we're, we're clear about where the district is falling short. So, you know, really communicating what is missing from the district's proposal. And Joey is going to um, share a little bit about that. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Joey Notaro. I'm the OEA treasurer and I'm also a math and science teacher at Fremont High School. So I'm gonna talk about some of the things that we presented to the district really briefly about uh, what we need in the language to really make sure that crisis distance learning is a strong start for every single student in Oakland. Um, and that it's amenable to what educators and teachers are expecting to be able to make the transition to crisis distance learning one where kids are going to get a high quality education. Um, so 
one of the areas in which we really need to see some language uh, in the district proposal is around ensuring that the synchronous instructional minutes are developmentally appropriate regarding the screen time and they're also aligned with state legislation. And we need to make sure that the workday is a flexible workday. So we've seen a lot of talk about uh, parents and educators, our own co-chair on the bargaining team has talked about the difficulty of balancing being a parent, taking care of elderly parents, and then also having to do one's job. And we heard this a lot from our teachers and educators in the spring. So we really wanna make sure that there is language protecting the flexibility of the workday for unit members that might not be able to work exclusively in the 815 to 345 workday like they normally would. Um, we also know that we wanna protect the flex time that teachers have and that educators have so that it's clear that it's teacher directed, it's educator directed, and it's at the discretion of our professional judgment to plan, prepare, provide feedback for our students and improve crisis distance learning. We also need some stronger language on tech access for students and educators alike to make sure that crisis distance learning will actually work since it is not safe to reopen in person. So the tech access is obviously a big one. We can't see improvements to it unless we actually make sure that every single student and every single educator has the tech that they need to do their jobs and to be able to access high quality instruction. I'm gonna pass it to Keith, uh, I'm sorry, Heath, to talk about some more of the contract language that we need to see. Thanks, Joey. Uh, and just to pick up what, uh, from where I was talking about earlier around the prep time, uh, we really wanna see uh, prep time that is teacher and member directed. Uh, I think as educators, uh, we all know that we're, we're the ones who know best how to manage our time and to decide for us what's gonna work for us and what's gonna help us plan. Uh, I think too many of us are familiar with the experience of participating in mandated uh, professional development that just doesn't really speak to what we need. And that's through no fault of uh, the hard work of maybe some administrators in the district. It's just, we know best in our own professional learning com uh, communities and our own kind of grade level teams and the people we work with, what it is that we need in terms of professional development. And so we wanna see a lot more uh, teacher driven and teacher and educator directed, um, teacher and educator directed professional development. The district is proposing too much uh, in terms of constraining what it is we can do with our professional development time and trying to mandate too many things that we just don't think are gonna be helpful to educators uh, for planning. So we really wanna see discretion for educators. Thank you, Heath. So if we don't reach an acceptable agreement um, by the time that school starts in about five minutes here, uh, we will be implementing the OEA strong start. And uh, we had 82% of the reps who voted approve this work action. Joey's going to explain to you exactly what the OEA strong start is and how it will set up not just the educators, but the students and the community for success. Thank you, Chess. So the OEA Strong Start is based on the feedback we heard coming out of the spring in what was working and not working in crisis distance learning. And from what we heard in our conversations with parent groups throughout the district and across the city. So among the things that we want in the OEA Strong Start is that we're beginning crisis distance learning. And to do that, we have to invest the time in establishing strong connections and relationships with our students and families. Tim already spoke to this a little bit. The social and emotional learning is at the center of what we do as teachers in being folks that are nurturing and caring for young people and making sure that their growth, development, and learning is at the center of everything that we do. So we really want to make sure there is a primacy on that at the beginning of the year, because last year when we went into shelter in place, we had eight months in the classroom with our kids. And unfortunately for many of them, it was not enough for us to continue that relationship when we really need that time to invest early, early on. So we're asking the district, we need to do this to invest the first two weeks just in building those relationships and making sure that we have strong foundation with our kids. We also need to have time to plan together like Heath already mentioned and engage in quality professional development that is specific to the needs of us as educators. So we recognize that the district is going to provide plenty of development for families, teachers, and students, uh, pl plenty of trainings and professional development. And we just want educators to be able to direct themselves to which 
instructions are appropriate for where they are in their career and what makes sense to improve their own instruction and crisis distance learning. And then lastly, we cannot start on August 10th without all of our students and all of our teachers and all of our educators having access to the technology they need to learn and to be successful. And they need that support in using it. We know there may be some delays, but we cannot start the year on August 10th, day one, knowing full well that we have not had the opportunity to distribute tech to most of our families. So without making sure that we're doing that at the front and the beginning of the year, with the relationships that we built and a foundation and planning for what it means to transition to crisis distance learning, we are not prepared for a start without an OEA strong start. Thank you, Joey. I think you'll see, you can see that um, we are holding our students and our community at, at the forefront of everything that we're doing and moving forward in a way to best support them. But you might be wondering, what does that look like in different grade levels? So um, we're going to hear from Tue, who's going, and possibly Maranatha too, to speak about what that looks like in preschool. What will the strong start look like for preschoolers? Thank you, Chaz. Uh, my name is Tue May, and I'm a preschool teacher at Highland um, Child Development Center. And um, definitely uh, the strong start, we will certainly be using this time to connect with our students um, and also our families and other team members um, to make sure that um, first, that they're healthy, they're safe, and that they have all the necessary tools needed to support crisis distant learning and also support our students' social emotional. Maranatha, do you wanna add something? Sure, Tue, thank you. And I realize I didn't introduce myself earlier. I'm Maranatha and I work um, at Acorn Woodland CDC as a preschool teacher. Um, so yes, I think, I mean, imagine three to five-year-olds getting on Zoom. I mean, so we have to really think about how all the issues that they might have, getting on it, being able to mute themselves, unmute themselves, creating community, um, setting, you know, uh, co-creating expectations, routines. So, I mean, that in and of itself is going to take some time to really um, mitigate those issues. Um, also really building, a, relationships with families, I think is gonna be the biggest uh, key in order to um, reach our students, um, making sure that they have the tech that they need. Um, and we are planning on giving them 60 minutes a, a day. Um, and that will be during that first, big, the, the, the strong start, that would probably be Zoom one-on-one, um, -on -one. we might FaceTime each other. Um, it's probably gonna look different depending on the family. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Maranatha. And so after we kind of transition from preschool on over to elementary, Catherine's going to share with us what Strong Start will look like in the elementary schools. Thank you, Chaz. And thank you, Maranatha and Tue. Um, you really set us up in preschool for the way school is going to begin and what people are, um, expect from us. And as teachers, we know that we don't just walk into a classroom and start teaching academic content. It's really important for us to build relationships with the students and of course with their families. And this is a key component. We are going to spend an hour every day in classes, getting everybody familiar with one another, but also spending individual time learning about our students and their families and how um, the, what strengths they bring into the classroom. And then that will also, the OEA Strong Start provides us time to be able to think about what standards are we gonna focus in on and meeting our students where they are. We know that Vlad has already talked about the learning loss that may have occurred over the summertime and during this period. And we really want to be able to meet our students where they are to differentiate instruction, to give them what they need in small groups. And we'll need time to plan for that to meet them, to meet their needs. And um, we're really excited to get started. And um, I'm gonna pass that off and thank you all again. Thank you, Catherine. Heath is going to talk to us about Strong Start in secondary. 
Uh, hello again, everyone. So yeah, at the secondary level, so for high school and middle school, we're really focusing on trying to spend the first two weeks just connecting with our students uh, for an hour a day. And that can be through a community meeting uh, on like a Zoom call. Uh, it could be through phone calls, texts, um, you know, using Google Classroom. Uh, the idea is just to make sure you're building community and strong relationships with all uh, of your, mainly probably your advisory students, but if you have your rosters and wanted to, you know, reach out to students you're going to have as well, you could do that, I think, uh, in addition, and then just mark daily attendance for the advisory. Um, and you also want to, like we've said, make sure that students are getting tech distribution uh, and also conduct wellness checks with families, because, you know, both of those things are critical. If students don't have technology, they're not going to be able to engage in distance learning. And if there's issues in the home, then we need to know about that so that we're kind of making sure that the right interventions are taking place and we're trying to support families in the best way possible. Um, and then the remainder of the day is another four hours where you're just spending time doing uh, crisis distance learning planning basically for whatever courses it is you're teaching. Um, and you decide what that looks like in terms of how you plan for that. And so it should be totally teacher directed uh, planning time and collaboration time and even professional development, but it's up to you as an educator, uh, how you use that time. Um, and again, you know, we know we want to make the experience of crisis distance learning better than it was in the spring. Um, and so, you know, while you're doing the planning, you can direct students, uh, and even if it's beneficial to you for yourself, to any of the district provided virtual trainings, uh, once you've kind of set students up with tech and uh, devices and all the necessary things. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Heath. Um, next, we're going to hear from Patty, who's going to kind of give a little summary in Spanish. Buenas tardes, familias y comunidad de Oakland. Este, mi nombre es Patricia Segura y soy una de las negociadoras de cabecera del de Sindicato de Maestros de OUSD. Les queremos comunicar lo que está pasando. Como ven ahorita, tenemos 21 de los miembros de nuestro sindicato este, negociando con el distrito para llevar a cabo unas negociaciones que beneficien a la comunidad, a sus hijos y a los maestros, e igual de todos nuestros miembros. Este, estamos empujando muy duro para este, que haya un criterio muy delineado que asegure la, la seguridad de nuestro, re, de nuestro regreso a casa, este, a las escuelas, perdón, de regreso a las escuelas, y estamos luchando por este, que se nos dé todo lo que es apropiado para poder re regresar. Uh, en el momento estamos enfocados en cómo se va a llevar a cabo el aprendizaje durante el aprendizaje de distancia. Este, y tenemos muy seguros que no, el distrito no está preparado para iniciar el año escolar y seguridad de, de que todos los alumnos tengan la tecnología necesaria, igual que los maestros. ¿no? Entonces, este, estamos luchando para que se nos den también más horas de de preparación porque los maestros tenemos que aprender mucho para poder enseñar mejor a sus hijos. Es un nuevo sistema que no, no nadie estaba preparado para esta situación y necesitamos ese entrenamiento, ese tiempo para entrenar y preparar nuestras lecciones para que sus hijos puedan tener éxito en las clases y que puedan recuperar algo del aprendizaje que se ha perdido desde el año pasado. So les pedimos que por favor se unan a la lucha de los maestros. Estamos luchando por el bienestar de ustedes, de sus familias y de todos nuestros miembros. Este, esperemos que, que estén con nosotros en esta lucha y que les digan al distrito que no van a tolerar nada, este, que no sea justo para ustedes y para sus familias. Thank you, Patty. And I want to thank everyone on the bargaining team for all their hard work and con contributions today and ask all of you out there to keep following OEA for Facebook updates. And if you're an educator with questions about the OEA Strong Start, please ask your site rep. If you're a parent, thank you for continuing to stand with our Oakland teachers. And I would like to pass it back to our president, um, Keith Brown, for a few closing remarks. Thank you, Chaz. And um, again, thank you for everyone um, listening and watching this um, Facebook update. And just uh, again to um, our, our members, our 
um, students and families that um, we want the district to be able to meet with us, that we come to an agreement to make sure that crisis distance learning is a much improved experience for all of our um, students. And we are committed to making that happen. So if we do not have that tentative agreement, um, OEA educators, we are committed to implementing the OEA Strong Start to make sure that um, our students have the best education possible during crisis distance learning. So thank you for watching. And we are hopeful that also um, um, district representatives are watching today so that we could be able to come to an agreement um, for our, our students and families so we can have clear um, direction for the beginning of this school year. Um, stay um, updated to Facebook Live and thank you for watching.